good morning. Um, my name is Milena. I come from Open Knowledge and I lead a project called School of Data. Um, and I'd like to introduce you today to the School of Data Journalism. Uh, so I don't know if you've been at the festival before, uh, but Open Knowledge Foundation, together with the European Journalism Center, are organizing every year for over three years now the School of Data Journalism track within the, the festival. Uh, so today we're kicking off that event with a panel moderated by my colleague Mirko from the European Journalism Center. And he also has many hats. He will tell you everything about, uh, about himself in a minute. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the School of Data Journalism and how you can follow and how you can contribute and what it's all about. Um, so as you see there, it's organized by, as I said, European Journalism Center and Open Knowledge. Uh, each of these organizations has like a data, data project. Uh, EJC runs data-driven journalism, so I encourage you to go on datadrivenjournalism.net data -driven and check it out. And we in Open Knowledge run School of Data, so we teach journalists and, and activists everything about how to use data effectively. Uh, so we joined forces this year, as we did uh, the years before, uh, for the School of Data Journalism. And it's really a track within the festival. We're organizing a couple of panels. This is the first one. There's another one tomorrow. And about nine workshops. Uh, and we have topics, everything from how to use sensor data with Arduinos. You must be familiar with Arduinos in Italy. Uh, to how to scrape websites, how to use APIs to use Twitter data, um, how to do mapping and tell stories with mapping and so on. Um, so we'll be down in Hotel San Gallo, like last year. So I encourage you to come to our workshops and, and check, check it out. And if not, you can also follow us on Twitter, um, DJ, DDJ School. Uh, you have the, the, the hashtag there. So we'll be reporting live, we'll be telling you news and everything. Uh, one small addition from last year. Uh, we will have, um, by popular demand, certificates for you guys um, and badges and stuff like this. So come, come to the workshops to check out a bit more the details. With no further ado, I'd, I'll pass the, the mic to my colleague Mirko, who will introduce the panel and will let us know what we're going to talk in the first event of the, at the school. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, yeah, regarding the many hats, I'm involved both with a public broadcaster in Germany as a, uh, being part of the innovation department there for the last eight years and involved with a startup called Data Wrapper, uh, where we provide a service for newsrooms. Uh, the topic today is kind of um, touching on the illusion and the question that uh, all journalists around the world currently have, like um, when the old business models are going away, What's going, what are the options to replace them? Uh, in a lot of local newsrooms, uh, if you ask the people, how many people have you been 15 years ago, five years ago, there were more. Now they're less, and usually they have to do something with print and something with online at the same time. And we've been discussing about data-driven journalism for about five years in a, in a different tone, tonality, like putting, uh, adding to computer-assisted reporting, which is much uh, of an older practice. The relevance of data has risen, and I have here on the panel, um, firstly, um, Sharon Moshavi, um, who's going to be talking about the experience with the project in your organization, Gregor Eich from the New York Times, who's going to talk about the non-economics of the graphics department of uh, uh, where you work, and Raju Narisati uh, is the vice president of News Corporation. I want to start with like five, six minutes, uh, you know, providing a little bit of the ground for discussion and questions from you later. Um, and first of all, uh, a disclaimer, if we start putting a price tag on every act of journalism, we lo essentially lose what journalism is all about. So when we're talking about making money, it's not saying that this article is more valuable than the other. It's not how it's going to work out. 
But at least um, I would identify three areas of in uh, where news organizations should be active and have a specialized knowledge in order to um, enable uh, uh, sustainable newsrooms. The first one would be investments. The second one would be services. And only the third one would be editorial um, uh, um, services. So uh, regarding investments, um, thinking like a startup. Um, a few years ago, I was kind of surprised when the, new, uh, when the Guardian was saying that the Scots Trust, which was financing its losses for, for quite a long time, for decades, was running out of money. And then in 2014, they sold uh, their stake in Autotrader CO UK to um, a venture capitalist uh, for a sizable sum. They are now sitting on around 700 million pounds. It was even tax-free. Uh, it kind of evades me how that was tax-free. But the point here is that by um, investing shrewdly and at an early time, um, a news organization can be as successful as any other company like Google, all the technology companies, in um, taking its share of, of the money that is around there. And of course, there is no connection to the journalism The Guardian does, but as an organization, and that's my point, um, we always had a left side where we would have the auditorial stuff in the newspaper and a right side where we would do the advertising to finance the journalism. Right? And there would be a connection between. It would not be the same thing, but there would be a connection. So um, another point, and I think it's a bit of an unsung hero that Andrew Miller, the, the CEO of The Guardian, who is going to leave the organization uh, in June uh, this year, um, that there are people who make the money to uh, make the investment into the newsroom. And The Guardian is in a good position now to deliver world-class journalism from a position of financial strength, which is surprising enough. So the second thing is generate digital revenue by understanding usage data. I think that is a complex area in itself, and um, again, it's a big name. Um, the New York Times managed to, by now, have more digital subscribers than print subscribers uh, for the last two years. Um, here's a chart from the uh, Economist showing that development, um, how that switches. It's the only major uh, newspaper in the U.S. that does at this point. Um, and while it's not easy, uh, it can work for smaller newsrooms as well. Um, if anybody is interested in um, uh, doing more investigation on that, the Texas Tribune is doing relatively well. It's a um, uh, um, non-profit newspaper for Texas, employing 60 journalists by now. Uh, they have a healthy conference business. Uh, they do a lot of data journalism on a local uh, level. Um, it's kind of a model for how we can finance uh, local journalism. And then, uh, thirdly, editorial, uh, what do readers, users really want? Um, here, my current um, favorite example uh, is a website called The Wirecutter. And most surprisingly, all they do is they write text. They write texts uh, about products and tell you what product you could buy. And the change they're actually applying is that they say, which is the right product right this moment to buy? So they spare you uh, 50 hours of comparing yourself. Uh, the way they make money with that is that they are connected as an affiliate to Amazon and they get uh, a share of the revenue if somebody is buying it. Whenever I present that to younger or older journalists, they say, wait, is that my future that I'm writing product reviews? Uh, they don't like it. Again, um, this is an act of service. It's a service model. Uh, I find it amazing that after 15 years of discussion about new models, it's essentially good text like saying the best small TV, buy this one, that's it. And then they have three, you know, they have three, four pages of arguing why that uh, they can reach that decision. But essentially, at the end of it, it's a good narrative. Uh, and um, looking a little bit into the future, I think we are heading for a data-driven, data-educated edu educated world. And we will see, like what I'm showing here, it's uh, from, uh, from a video of uh, visually, it's a few times ago. People will expect to walk the street, see something, and get an instant opinion. And who's going to deliver these opinions and recommendations? Is it uh, a journalism organization or is it a purely marketing organization? That will make a difference. And I think there is a position for journalists and uh, journalism organizations to take. We learned a lot from the innovation report by the New York Times last year. Um, 
What will not work is simply transferring the old models where we lost advertising uh, into a digital world because you can see the data, the five largest web firms earn 64% of all online ad spending, the top 50 get 90%. The efficiency of doing advertising on the web have turned around. The small new local newspapers that made a lot of money for decades, that is not the model that you can transfer into the digital age. Um, on the other side, um, and that's my, my, my final three claims, um, I would argue that as we're speaking, companies already are calculating what they're doing while most of us are still guessing. It's a big change. Uh, who is fiercely on the side of the user? Who will be able to give recommendations on big uh, decisions in life? Uh, who has the data crunched for that? Like what profession should my kids take? Uh, what financial plan should I take? How should I finance my house? These are decisions to be taken by millions of people. They are important decisions. And I would love to see journalists being on the side of the user. And that's the final from me. I think we should be looking into uh, a new model, um, which will be moving from attention, what we have now, uh, to trust. If you are trusted as an organization, if as a voice, uh, the communication is much simpler because people will simply do what you tell them because they know they can trust you. Okay, thanks, that's for me. Um, shall we move over to Gregor? We just switch around the PC. Yeah, this is stretched. Okay. Cool. Uh, um, yeah, hi. Um, I'm uh, Gregor. I'm graphics editor at the New York Times. Um, I'm trying to get this work. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm part of a team of about 40 graphics editors. Um, and we are doing... Um, Essentially, all the graphics in the in the New York Times, um, including uh, including traditional news graphics like charts, um, but also um, maps, uh, which are like which we always do in um, like breaking news e events or um, uh, explanatory pieces on uh, different crisis zone. We do. Um, like little explainer pieces uh, that use illustrations to, um, um, yeah, like explain the the negotiations, the nuclear ne negotiations with uh, Iran, um, and we also we also do uh, those long form um, um, storytelling pieces like uh, that kind of started with Snowfall and um, and the and this is also done by our team. Um, what 
here's here's one graphic that I want to show that I that I made um, last year uh, that shows the mi uh, migration of people inside the United States. So those are like all people living in California, um, and for each year over time, you see where like the breakdown where those people where those people uh, were born. So when you see like in, at some point. Um, uh, this this top line is New York, so this is New Yorkers in uh, uh, living in, in California. And we did those charts for every state. And the reason I'm showing this chart is this is probably the closest I got to any kind of money making because we had this idea of uh, uh, turning it into a product. Uh, <laughs> so we uh, we went to like those uh, a kind of online shop and and made all like fifty. Uh, um, 50 marks, um, and yeah, and we promoted this on Facebook, but it, um, yeah, it was just like a fun piece. And uh, yeah, the main reason why we didn't, uh, why, why we usually not deal with, uh, with the question of how to make money is that uh, the New York Times is traditionally um, split between um, the business side and the, and the newsroom side. I work on the newsroom side, so um, we spend the money and the business side uh, makes the money um, and uh, and it's kind of uh, um, nice not ha not having to think about it um, yeah obviously we um, um, yeah with the innovation report um, there's there's uh, there was there was a, a section where it was saying that we need to um, maybe find a bridge between the two to um, uh, for instance, grow our audiences, um, which is one of, which is a business target. But now we have a team that is working on the business side and in the newsroom, an audience development team. So there are like first uh, um, attempts to um, to find a bridge between the two worlds. And um, yeah, um, that's essentially my introduction. And yeah, I look forward to the discussion. Need any data to know that conferences and technology <laughs> don't go together well? Well, well, it's happening. Help? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let me start it. This computer has a mind of its own. Yeah, we can look. Oh, it's right sharing. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. I don't know if I know my hand to go forward. Yes. Yeah, but I don't know if I want to speak. Oh, that's, yeah, just show the world. Oh, come back. Use the play. Maybe you should use Wolfpack back for the other one, and then we'll just do it. Could you play the first of those first two you were talking about? Yeah. Okay. Was it this just flip through the slides there is and then? Okay, can someone just hit it from there? I'll just tell you when to move. Yeah. Who's doing it? Who's operating that? Is that you? Oh. Whoa. Okay, and, how do, and when am I hitting to go forward? Gregor, how do I hit to go forward? Yeah, this? Okay. Okay. Can you okay. Put okay. All the text that gets around in between? Uh. Sure. Whatever. Okay. That's the word that's missing is journalism. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm with uh, the International Center for Journalists, um, Sharon Moshavi, um, Vice President of New Initiatives. Um, and what ICFJ does is we support media innovation around the world. Um, so we basically, we really work with local homegrown innovators. Uh, we often bring them on as our ICFJ Knight Fellows. Uh, and what I want to do is kind of just quickly go through some of the projects. There we go. Go through some of the projects that are relevant to the discussion today, which is how do you make money and is it possible uh, in the world of data? Um, so first pro project I wanted to highlight is something called the Star Health Portal. Uh, and this uses 
easily um, accessible open data. This was initially developed by Code for Africa, a civic tech lab that was, uh, works with media. It was developed by our fellow Justin Arenstein, who is here. Um, and they produced that by developing, uh, embedding a developer in the Star Newsroom in Kenya. And this app has basically kind of, um, there's news product around it, but there's basically three, three apps on the portal. There's Dodgy Doctors. You can find out if your doctor's licensed or is a quack. Um, am I covered? You find out what your insurance covers and lets you find the nearest specialist for whatever ails you. Um, it's available free on the web, but there's also a premium SMS service. And that basically, premium SMS, this is in Kenya, costs 40 cents. It's a revenue share between the mobile carrier and the news organization. They're getting about 80,000 SMSs a week, not a small number. Um, they're earning about $16,000 a week. Um, and that's not bad in a country where editors earn about $1,200 a month and, report, and reporters earn about half that. So that money in turn then goes to pay for editorial. It actually pays for the science and health desk. It allowed the star to create that. Um, and we're actually now working to, uh, to replicate uh, a version of this with news organizations in Nigeria and in South Africa. The next project I wanted to mention is something called the Medicine Prices Database. This also uses open data, but more difficult to access data. Uh, basically inputs medicine pricing information from 13 countries in Southern Africa. The meds are bought by the governments for hospitals, clinics, that sorts of things. And it analyzes what different countries pay for drugs. Uh, they've identified about $410 million in overcharges by pharmaceutical companies, um, and governments are now actually trying to recoup that. So then um, the Code for Africa, Code for South Africa technically, said, hmm, it's a good idea, maybe we can make it better, and they built a, a public site, a, a mobile app that helps the public monitor whether they're being overcharged for prices, overcharged for drugs, and whether there might be a cheaper generic available. Um, that tool has now been bought by uh, NASPERS Media 24, which is uh, the, lar the fifth largest media organization on the planet, so not a small group. Um, and their revenue model is based on a premium <coughs> SMS service. And one reason that's key is because it doesn't cannibalize your advertising. It's a, it's a new revenue stream. Um, it's also interesting to note that this project came out of a newsroom experiment to decide, basically demonstrate how so-called boring data um, and can be used to transform uh, um, news apps. Is it possible? Um, and it was only prioritized for ongoing support actually after a bunch of doctors and p members of the media complained when the site actually was taken down when the experiment happened. So they actually put it back up, supply and demand. Um, sorry, my slides are not as pretty. I'm not a graphics editor, as you can tell. Um, anyway, we have uh, another tool called Ciazana, and this uses more obscure, hard to find, and hard to analyze data. This is basically a social network analysis tool built by our fellow Friedrich Lindenberg, who I saw somewhere around here. Friedrich, are you here? Have you abandoned? Oh, he's there. Okay, anyway, Friedrich. Uh, and he built it for ANSIR, for the uh, African Investigative Networks, um, which is run by Khadija Sharifa, who I think is somewhere around here too, Khadija. So shout out to you. Um, and basically what Ciazana does is digitizes court and uh, corporate records in 14 different countries, also uses data from newspaper archives, from land, land records, mine records. Um, to date, it's mapped about 90,000 politically exposed people in South Africa, so substantial size. Um, it is a free service, but again, there's a revenue model. There's a premium service toolkit launching called Aleph, um, and that lets you actually mine the data. It's much more interactive. And that the target customers there are really corporations, due diligence firms, research firms, credit agency, anybody who really wants that information and is willing to pay for it. Um, the data on Ciazan and Aleph has been used in stories published across Africa and also in, uh, in other media, Le Monde, Al Jazeera, and as of today in ICIJ and Italy's own L'Espresso, um, which has a story mapping the Italian mafia's holdings across Africa. Um, and what we're seeing is a lot of sort of what we call south to south innovation, a lot of ideas spreading. So this concept isn't confined to Africa. Uh, another organization we work with in Latin America called Podropedia, uh, founded by our f fellow Miguel Paz, they're doing similar work on mining data, looking for ties between politicians and business and illicit networks. And the olive revenue model is, is possible, something that's something that they could do down the line as well. Slides are so boring, I can't tell which one from the other. Um, <laughs> uh, this is another interesting site, South African site, called Open Bylaws. 
Um, and um, uh, this offers data on municipal laws and ordinances. Uh, it was built for the city desk of a Cape Town newspaper uh, to help them re report stories about zoning. Um, and then they realized, gee, gosh, we have all this digitized ordinance info that nobody else has. Huh, maybe we can do something with it. Um, so they built a free site. But then a couple of revenue models came out of it. Code for South Africa built this, they sold it as a premium API to Media24. Uh, and Media24, in turn, is using that data to power their own set of premium, i.e., people pay for it, property data tools on a site they have called Property24. Um, so there's been revenue uh, generated across the board in a couple of these guys. Um, this is a really interesting site. We worked with Voz Data with La Nacion in Argentina. Um, a shout out to our fellow Sandra Crucianelli who helped La Nacion build the data team that built this. Um, this is not generating revenue yet, I'd say yet, um, but what it does is it harnesses the crowd to analyze data. It's made data analysis, data gathering cheaper, and that, that's, that's not revenue, but if you spend less, that helps you make more, um, right? Isn't that, is that basic how, how the math works? Um, and um, it also builds engagement, which increases traffic, which leads to increased re revenue. It's really just, it's cost-effective data acquisition, and it's focused on engagement. So what Voz Data has done is basically put a bunch of uh, Senate expense records, 6,500 Senate expense records online, and lets users review and rate them. They've collectively gone through about 4,000 documents to date, found all kinds of nefarious, under, you know, anything you would expect in how your public servants are spending your money, you know, it's in there, they found it. Um, to ensure accuracy, each document is, uh, is processed um, at three times through three different users, and La Nacion does obviously a lot of fact checking. Um, and now we see a similar approach to this being taken by Source Africa, Source Africa uh, an African venture. So again, we're seeing a lot of sort of cross-pollination, people seeing ideas that work and trying to exper experiment with that in their own newsrooms. Um, so I mentioned uh, Code, for South, Code for South Africa, which is one of the sort of sub subs of Code for Africa. Um, and that, that's a different kind of revenue model, which is a data team and as a service provider and a tool builder. Um, and Code for South Africa, by building, powering <coughs> data-driven projects for newsrooms, they're now building about a million dollars a year. That's not bad. Um, and they're building things like they, they build and then sell, and they're also building things on commission. Uh, something, for example, called living wage, which lets you calculate if you're paying your domestic staff a fair wage, which works in a part of the world where many people have domestic staff. Um, and again, that model, um, we're looking at it uh, for something called Chequiato, which is a Buenos Aires-based fact-checking website. Uh, if anybody knows it, they're building a data journalism team um, with help from our fellow there, and they potentially want to sell their services. Um, and like Voz Data, they're also harnessing the crowd to make data gathering and analysis cheaper. Uh, they're creating a platform where people can submit data and documents that they discover. Um, we are also, somebody mentioned sensors before, we're also starting to experiment with citizen data using things like sen sensors. We've got a few fellows uh, out developing sensor projects. We're working with the Hindustan Times in India on an air pollution sensor project uh, with Zawafi, which is a community-based news outlet in, in Southern Africa on uh, two sensor projects, dust pollution and cholera. Um, and, and these, are, I think, are interesting projects because these are kind of referring to what Mirko said before, but these are actionable data. This matters in people's lives. They can do something with the information. You know, they can avoid water from a particular source on a particular day. You can say, okay, I'm not gonna send my kid out to play this afternoon because the air quality is even crappier than usual. Um, and this is the kind of information that people, you know, we're starting to see people will pay for. Um, and the model can often, in, in these, for example, the model here where we're looking at for revenue is revenue sharing with mobile companies on premium S SMS services. Um, as you can see, I mean, most of the examples I'm giving are Global South, and the economic model is, is very different in the Global South. Um, there's really a scarcity of credible, actionable information. I mean, that's, you have, we're all overloaded, but there, you know, there's a lot, a lot of scarcity. Um, but news media have an advantage that I think, Mirko, you kind of alluded to. You know, you know, we've got reach. You know, we're information experts, and journalists can authenticate the information and understand how to create information-based products. Um, so I think that, that those are important things to remember. Um, 
The other thing that we are doing a lot of is experimenting, and, and this I think is key. Um, and we're doing it cheaply. I mean, a lot of these projects, a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars to get off the ground. Um, we're really trying to see what works and what doesn't. And you, you need small budgets, smaller than times budgets, um, to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, we're piloting, uh, working with three Latin American uh, organizations right now, developing data-driven projects. We've got data experts embedded in their newsrooms. And these are focused on accountability data, crime, budgets, state budgets, contracts. Um, these are experiments, and we don't know if there's any revenue model here where we're trying to find out. We want to see if some of the news reporting that's being developed in the course of the projects, if they're, you can acquire and structure maybe enough data to create, you know, sort of long-tail data projects. We don't, we don't know the answer we're trying to find out. Um, a couple of things that I think, though, in, to sum up that, uh, two things needed for revenue, I think, around data journalism we've found are sort of, there are two really key elements. One, as I, as I mentioned before, is scarcity of information. If it's already freely available, no one's going to pay for it. It's just, they're not, nobody's dumb. Um, the other key factor is demand. Um, do people want it? Do they need it? Are they going to use it? Does it contribute anything to their lives? And I don't think journalists quite have their head around that yet. I, do, I just I don't think we're there yet. Um, and maybe that's something we can we can discuss. Um, so anyway, um, let's skip that. So that's it. That's that's me. Here's my Twitter. If anyone wants to reach out to me? The presentation link is there. Um, I'll tweet it out. And um, if anybody's got any ideas, um, projects, they want to replicate anything, anybody wants to be a fellow, come talk to me. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Raju Narisetti. Um, I work for News Corp. Despite my Italian sounding name, <laughs> I'm not Guido Romeo, who's supposed to be here. I'm just filling in for him because he <laughs> couldn't make it. So I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is I don't have slides, so none of the technology <laughs> issues will come into play. The bad news is uh, the topic for today is um, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I'm here to say that there are no pots of gold in our business. And as you all know, rainbows are temporary. So we can put to rest that there is something miraculous out there that will save our uh, industry or help our industry in a significant way, and um, especially data. But at the same time, I think there are just a lot of um, opportunities around data that um, the publishing business uh, can leverage um, in two separate buckets. A lot of conversations about data uh, tends to be around the journalistic end of it. Uh, you've seen a lot of examples of really great journalism accompanied by really great interactive data that allows readers to kind of uh, immerse themselves. I think the prism there um, can't just be, can we turn this into revenue? As in like, will somebody pay a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars? Um, because there are significant challenges to taking journalism-led data products and trying to make just sheer money off that. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples of why that is. But it still has tremendous value, which can be monetized, um, which can lead to revenue maybe indirectly. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. But a lot of the conversation around data when it comes to publishing uh, touches on but never really focuses on the fact that our audiences, uh, you know, readers, viewers, are willing to give us a lot of their data, right? Their consumption data, who they are, what they want, like and what they don't like. And our industry typically has failed to take advantage of that and monetize that. And I think there is significant value. There may be, if not parts, some gold at the end of that data uh, search that we can uh, monetize. And I'll give you examples of that. So let's talk a little bit about journalism data products. I think part of the challenge that most newsrooms face is that they tend to be amazing journalistic projects. So some investigative reporter will team up with an editor, will team up with a good data person, and they'll come up with this amazing project. And that turns into very, very cool interactive experiences. There's a database behind it. And what happens is typically at the end of it, they'll say, maybe we can sell this. right? And then they try to go to the business side and convince them that there is potentially a market here. The business side usually doesn't think so, but because the newsroom is asking, they play along with it and they'll try something, but the chances are that it's not really a commercial product that you can sell on a sustainable basis. The other reason for this is 
companies that sell data, companies that kind of their core business is data products, um, tend to kind of invest a lot in that and then tend to kind of support it over the years. Most journalism projects tend to be passion projects. Like I said, you know, a group of journalists get together and agree to do something. But uh, six months later or a year later, if it's a really long project, the entire team typically moves on to the next new thing. And data and data products deteriorate fairly quickly once you put them out there. So usually in newsrooms, there is nobody left behind to maintain and update that product by which you can then tell somebody pay. Right? So that's a big challenge. So before you embark on these projects, uh, you've got to think about what happens in year two when the editor has moved on, when the journalist has moved on, when the graphics people have moved on, what happens to this product if you're thinking of it as a product. So I think that's a critical flaw in how we usually think of these things. The other area is that ability to sync this journalism project with payment systems and kind of marketing. Those are all things that we typically don't think about because to try to sell data products, you have to have a marketing plan, you have to have a payment plan, and what happens to the money, how do you collect it? That's something we don't think about. The other thing that happens with data projects in newsrooms is that everybody figures out how much it'll cost to put together version one of a product, right? And everybody says, it's only going to cost us $1,000 to do this, let's just do it. People forget that you have to have a V2, V3, V4, V5, and you have to have a stream of upgrades and things like that that need money. And unless you have a plan and unless somebody has thought through who's going to pay for that, these products tend to be a pretty bad experience very quickly. So again, something to um, uh, think about. And then finally, just a quick, um, uh, quick point is that oftentimes the newsrooms come up with the idea, come up with an execution, come up with a visualization, and pretty much have it all nearly done before they go to the business side and say, what do you think we can do with this? I would highly suggest that you should begin at the beginning and include them when you're mapping out the project. Otherwise, it's just very hard to kind of take something that is almost finished and then try to find customers willing to pay for it because the needs of the customers, as Sharon was saying about demand, may be slightly different from what your journalism data product is. So these are all some of the issues to think about. Um, it is easy for newsrooms to look at the business side and realize that there's revenue challenges and how can we help them and be very enthusiastic about it. But oftentimes, our enthusiasm causes more problems than actual revenue. So just something to um, think about. But there is fundamental value in journalism data products in helping revenue. For example, if you create a very, very compelling you know, project on where you came from, that means that a lot more people are spending a lot more time on your website, giving a lot of um, their time playing with the database. And there is significant revenue value there um, because the more people come to the site, the more you can monetize them with one catch. If you look at the majority of journalism big projects, they actually sacrifice all revenue because of the user experience. Almost all of them will have full page graphics. They will take out the existing advertising to create templates that actually make no money. These are empty calorie projects, good for egos, but they're actually losing you money, right? So if you're serious about helping the business side make money, when you come up with templates, make sure that the templates don't take away revenue. Right? This is a huge problem that actually happens because almost every project that you see will be beautiful, will be amazing, but they would have actually taken out the ad positions. They could, anything that has the ability to make money is usually gone from that, right? So rather than try to figure out a way to sell this product, just think of like, can I use this engagement to actually generate more advertising revenue, which is an existing business model, right? So something to kind of really um, think about. But there's a fundamental value in democratizing um, data by, used to be that an investigative reporter would look at a database, write four stories, and present it to you. Right? That was the end of the project. Now, obviously, they will still do that, but they then turn over the database to you for you to kind of use it. So I think there's tremendous value in kind of engagement and uh, bringing readers and keeping them provided you are actually kind of also helping uh, make money. The second part, and I'll briefly talk about this, is the issue of like thinking about data in, uh, in terms of a business sense. Our readers are actually giving us, whether they like it or not, uh, often they don't mind, a lot of data. 
And I think most newsrooms are not really particularly utilizing that um, to kind of drive revenue. Um, we don't really understand, um, analyze, and then use audience behavior outside of the newsroom to drive revenue. Simple examples, right? Where people come into the site, whether they come to a sports section and then they go to politics, or whether they come to the homepage or go somewhere else, is very critical data that you can really leverage because if so you know that Sharon always comes to the New York Times through politics, spend some time there, and the next thing she does always is to go to the homepage or go to, let's say, sports or go to Washington coverage. When she's on this page, that's when you, because you know her behavior, that's when you surface relevant articles on those pages because you know she's gonna go there. And if it's a paid site, for example, if you come to the Wall Street Journal, we know that you come through sports, but your next stop almost always is politics. But you're not a subscriber. What we are increasingly doing is when you are in sports, we are surfacing five politics stories, knowing that you like politics, showing that some of them are locked or keyed, meaning that they have a paywall, and kind of signaling to you that if you had paid for the Wall Street Journal, these stories that you actually like a lot, because we know what you do, we don't tell you that, but we know what you do, will be available to you, right? So th that is using data to try to convert somebody who is a casual visitor and reader into a potential subscriber. And that's the kind of data use that I think most publishers need to evolve to because that's where there's value. There is significant, uh, my personal feeling is there is a whole privacy economy that will emerge where the value of our data, value of our customers is significant to our advertisers and to readers. And if we can monetize that, we don't have to worry about trying to create products that we can sell because we are usually not very good at that. I'll stop at that. Okay, Raju, I have uh, one additional question. Um, when you're saying that you are showing additional interesting content, um, what is your opinion on the future? Are we asking more time from the user or will there be a, a, a tendency to ask less time, like having more valuable data-driven models that you, know, that you don't read, have to read more, but get answers more quickly? So at the end of the day, all I'm competing for is the one single non-renewable resource that you have, which is your time. If I get a bit more of that, I win this battle, right? So I'm not really competing against other brands. I'm just competing for your time because that is shrinking. Because you can go now, um, you're very promiscuous, not you personally, <laughs> but generally, and you can go to a lot of different places because of technology. And if I can get you to spend more time with my content, it doesn't have to be at my site. It just has to be my content wherever you are, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or anywhere else. I think that's the battle we have to win, and that's only won by you know, great user experience and a great kind of um, uh, databases, great interactivity. So I'm less worried about kind of asking you to spend time with me on my site, but I'm definitely interested in taking a little bit more of your time from going to, let's say, The Guardian. Okay. I would like to extend on that question to all of you. Um, I think sometimes we are missing out on, uh, because of the complexity of what we do, whether in the West or in the North or in the South, uh, we're missing out on very simple principles. Like uh, no one of us is able to do calculations of interest on interest in your head. So when you do a mortgage for a house, uh, it's very hard to, to define the outcome. And if anybody changes anything in the equation, like it's 0.1% less for one mortgage versus the other, you're lost. You, don't, you cannot tell whether it's 6,000 or 8,000 or $9,000 difference. So my point here is that we should look into data visualization models that are not directly connected to editorial stuff, where we, for example, put uh, results of different calculations side by side and we are the trustable partner. Can you imagine such solutions, uh, newspapers helping people or media organizations helping people to make decisions on, 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 on finance, or do you, you don't see that? Um, thank you. I mean, I do see that. I do think they're going back to the demand issue. I do think, you know, news organizations need to serve their audiences, and news you can use, if I can use that mm -hmm. phrase, is it, 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 I think it provides two things. One, I think it, do, it does bring in, it, it's interactive, it brings audiences to you. And number two, there are potential revenue models out of it. It's information people want to pay for. I think the danger, though, is just putting up, but, but how do you do that, I think, is, part of, is, is, is hard, because putting up 
you know, pretty d data visualizations, which are not are hard to use, and I think that's the danger. They're you know, you know, the, the, the data porn, shall we say? Okay. Um, you know, I think they're they're some. I mean, that's for like what I'm seeing a lot is too much. Is an attempt to do that. We're sort of saying here, let's put up a, a visualization, and with no real thinking behind what is somebody actually going to need this for. But to your bigger point of can we do things to help people make decisions? I think absolutely. I do think that is the role of news organizations too. Uh, to 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 speak to the issues in people's lives to help answer you know the questions you know the things you know what keeps them up at night um, and I, I think it's totally a role that news organizations can play. You just brought up something very interesting, which I would pass on to Raju. Um, that simplicity is hard. Like if you really have this visualization that helps people and it's correct, uh, that is not done uh, in a weekend, right? Is that what you share as well? Yeah, I mean, I think engaging user experiences are always hard, and that's why folks like Gregor make a ton of money, because they're very valuable at th <laughs> figuring this out. <laughs> it's making a pitch for you to get a raise. <laughs> um, but I think the issue becomes when you trade off um, the um, user experience for possibly making money, right? There's always should be a balance, and I think sometimes if, the f if it's left up to the newsrooms, they will always kind of prefer the amazing experience at the cost of everything else. And my issue tends to be that uh, it can be, both can be done together, because end of the day, an amazing experience that actually loses money long term is not gonna be very viable. Um, so I think the balance is where sometimes not enough thinking uh, goes on. Okay. Uh, Gregor, when you start a project, um, do the expectation of how many clicks that might get play a role at all, or? Um, no, that that usually doesn't play a role. Um, it's more like when, when we're done with it, we're trying to find um, multiple ways to promote it. Um, like we're, we're not uh, just expecting people to find it on our homepage. And um, that, that used to be like the model for, for a long time that we would, we would try to put it on the homepage and there's this crazy fight in the newsroom of on homepage space, on page one space. Um, so now we are uh, trying to find audiences and find audiences at different places via social media um, and, and um, targeting, um, um, like marketing, like say we are having a story on, uh, on, on Brazil, on the, on the World Cup, what's happening around the World Cup and then we are like Times editors would translate it to um, Spanish because there's a large Spanish audience around the world, and um, so things like that happen. But it usually does not dictate our stuff. So we, we the policy kind of is we do the same uh, outstanding journalism that we used to do, but we're trying to find uh, new audiences and grow our audience around it. Was there a story where you uh, where there were uh, really a lot of clicks and you uh, everyone was surprised? And another earnest story that you really wanted to push, where you know clicks were less. Um, I mean, sure. There's always there's always differences. Um, so, for instance, and there's like big like major news events like the World Cup or elections. You you can you you know for sure that there's there will be like a ton of traffic on those stories. Um, some are like at least for me were like unexpected when we. Um, we did like one or two pieces on on the gaming, um, uh, like esports and um, industry, and there's this got huge traffic because there's like a whole new audience, uh, like millions of people playing computer games and watching other people playing computer games with uh, like peak audiences that are like competing with uh, CNN or MSNBC um, at times. Um, so yeah, doing 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 stuff on the, on those topics. Um, there's definitely a, a huge audience waiting for, for those stories. But then other topics like um, we were covering the de um, bankruptcy of Detroit and the, and the aftermath of it. And there's like not as much interest in that, but the Times de still dedicates a lot of um, um, manpower to those stories because we think editorially this story is worth covering. Um, it's a big national story. Um, so there's kind of a, a, a trade-off. We know we definitely build up this knowledge of like what stories would do well and would not do well, but we still um, like allow for both, so we don't just like do those stories. 
Are there any ways how news organizations can learn how to get more proximity into abstract data? Is there anything from your experience? You, d you were talking about the medicine uh, searches, which is very obvious. Like it's obvious, like a lot of people have this question, that you know, how do we transform these media brands that people are looking for this kind of information on a, on, a, on a news brand, right? Now, I think for most newspapers, they wouldn't expect that depth, right? No, probably not. I mean, I mean, one thing we're doing, I think, to solve that is you need to sort of invest in two sides. This is the spending money part, not the earning money part. But, you know, you need a data team and you need old gumshoe investigative reporting who knows how to find and ferret out data and look for things. I mean, that's what we've all been paid to do is to find information other people don't find. And if you if if you kind of if you if you feed both parts of the beast, both the sort of the product side and the and the and the, and the tech side, the tech teams build it. But you've got to have investigative investigative reporters uh, and reporters in general who can look for things that are that are hidden. That is supposed to be the job of journalists. I think part of the challenge is there is data and there is data, right? And most mainstream newsrooms tend to put their best data resources, best graphics, and best design resources against very difficult, complicated journalism topics, right? whether it's corruption or whether it's you know, financial kind of um, tracing the money issues. And I think there's a higher journalism value there, but those are very difficult to then kind of monetize in a conventional sense. But I think the way to think about it is that, am I building a tool for this project that is replicable and can be used in something that is much more news you can use? So it's building a set of tools and building a set of experiences that are replicable, then you're not spending as much money every time you're trying to do something. I think that's, there is significant value in thinking about it that way. And I'm curious with your organizations, I mean, in terms of rep rep replicability, are you doing that? Are you building things? Are you starting from scratch every time? Are you building things that are replicable? Yeah, we, we definitely uh, build things that are rep replicable. We have like an, uh, entire like tool set that we are like internal tools that we are using to publish as fast as possible um, like for instance to cover to cover breaking news um, with 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 graphics uh, we we need those kind of pipelines that are really fast from like um, so we can publish stuff in uh, in minutes it, it need to be um. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not yet a requirement, but it's increasingly just a resource issue. They're saying that if you build it once, if you can use it for five other things, that's better than building bespoke projects because it, there's a time issue and a cost issue. But neither time nor cost are often high considerations <laughs> in a newsroom. <laughs> so uh, not always the case. I think there's one scary part. Whenever a journalist organization starts to look into data and coding projects, like how do I manage that? Because it's kind of looking into a black hole. It could be very costly, could be highly complex. You were touching on, Sharon, you were touching on the point that most of the projects you do, which are at times very, very successful and can be replicated, uh, don't have big budgets. Yeah. Is Why? that is that part of, of winning it, just you know, having a limit to it? So you might not be talking about the three, four thousand it's, it's uh, the dollar project that failed, right? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, it's the mother of necessity too. You know, we, we have limited funds. Our partners generally, you know, we're working again in the global south. You know, some of them have more money than others, but um, it's also sort of just a philosophical approach. We're very much about piloting and experimenting. And if you're going to experiment, you really don't want to experiment with a lot of money. What if it doesn't work? Um, you know, you're not, I don't think we're ever going to do a waterfall type project in the, in the kind of work we're doing. It's just not in our DNA and not in the DNA of all of the, the, the innovators we're working with. So I do think that's one way, and, and replicability is, and scalability is, apps is another prerequisite. We're always looking for something, how can we, how can we move this around? And we see that, and, and it happens, you know, a bit by osmosis, but a bit by, by planning. You know, we had a project in Brazil that then went to Africa and wound up in Indonesia because it had a model that worked in those environments. Um, and it was cheap. Um, and that cheap also makes it much more easily repl replicable and scalable. Um, so I do think it's something, and I do think that it is, it, it's a lesson you can take as larger news organizations as well. Try it before you invest a whole lot of money in it and see if you can use it five or six more times. Okay, would you agree to that, or would you say every, what we're talking about is always a big budget and a waterfall multi-year project? Yes and no, right? I mean, did, if, for example, the 2016 U.S. elections are coming. Each newsroom probably has significant resources, a budget, and a kind of a game plan. 
And because it's a very competitive environment, they will want to kind of not particularly share, obviously, with others. But that's an investment that newsrooms are willing to make, or publishers are willing to make, because it's a very once in four years, it's a big event, drives a lot of audience. So I think it depends on the, um, on the event. But if you're like, you know, it's a routine events where you can use a, a tool, I think there is a pressure everywhere to try to kind of do it for cheap and kind of do it in a way that it gets used. But it's also important to remember that $3,000 sitting here may not seem a lot of money, but if I'm a newspaper in Kenya, boy, that is a lot of money. Right? So I think it has to be, it's the context of what that money is and how it's being used and uh, whether the top editors are willing to fund it is key. There are organizations like ICFJ and others, um, sorry, full disclosure, I am on the board of ICFJ, um, that are actually helping uh, these kind of uh, programs, but it's tough, especially in the Western context for a New York Times and a Wall Street Journal to share a tool because they're just by nature very competitive news organizations. Okay. One thing we're trying to do, we, we do same issue. Election, when we work in, with newsrooms, elections are, are that's a hot button. People want to gear up. This is where they're like, okay, we want to try sort of the latest latest stuff in when it comes to elections. But elections, as you pointed out, are often one-off things. And we find increasingly that when we're working on projects um, inside newsrooms that we're better off finding projects that are more sort of everyday ordinary because whatever we're doing in there is going to have more lasting systemic change than going in and doing something one-off around an election. Um, uh, what I found really, really interesting were these uh, hints at if you use premium SMS, uh, there is uh, sizable sums uh, related to the information provided by this specific model. Um, is there a willingness of people to uh, pay $1, $5, $5 per month um, for what we offer? Like, is, this subs is it a subscription model or is it one one-off models for, for data-driven products? So we, uh, I may be slightly an exception because at News Corp we don't try to unbundle, meaning that it's a subscription-based product anyway. So if you create something, it's part of the subscription. We don't try to sell that separately um, on top of it. I think the SMS text um, uh, situation is much more in the developing world. So Sharon might be able to answer that better. There is, There are some challenges, uh, two challenges. One is that the f carriers, the phone companies in those markets tend to take a disproportionate share of that revenue. So even if I'm willing to pay a dollar, you only get like 30 cents of it, right? So, if, so there's a, that issue. Two, um, it has to be able to work on uh, you know, one level below smartphones, right? So it has to be able, for it to really be a mass product. And for that, then you have to spend a lot of time and energy making your user experience that much more easier to use. There are bandwidth issues. So on paper, a lot of these projects sound like ideal, but in terms of actually generating consistent, <coughs> sustainable, growing revenue, still are a small portion of it. But at least, you know, you're making some money off it. I suppose. Yeah, and again, and again, I think context is too. In a lot of the places we're working, people are more used to using their phones to pay for things also. So the concept that you are making a micropayment or, or, or doing it, it's, you know, in Kenya, for example, you know, you have, you have mobile banking. I mean, so it's not a foreign thing to say, I'm going to pay a little more money and use my phone for something. I think in the U.S. especially, that's a little more people don't do that. And, 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 and U.S. publishers have struggled with the whole concept of micropayments, which you guys managed to avoid entirely and, and bundle. Um, so whether, you know, it's effectively a micropayment when, if you look at it. And I think that the success of that depends on the market. And the places we're working, places like South Asia and Latin America and Africa, there seems to be more of an appetite for doing that. Okay. I mean, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a data product, but the user experience of the NYT Now app clearly was good and attracted a lot of younger people, but not enough people wanting to pay. Yeah. So now the thinking has been, okay, if we are clearly able to attract young people, which is going to be monetizable in the future, why don't we make it kind of free and drive at least that? So I think it's a matter of experimenting. Obviously, a New York Times has the resources to take a big bet like that, have 20, 30 people invested in this project, and then two years later say, okay, we're going to change course. It's harder, obviously, for smaller newsrooms to make those kind of bets. Um, but there, like I said, there is no clear path to a pot of gold. It's just a matter of experimenting and trying to see what works and what doesn't. Sometimes you have resources, and sometimes you have organizations like ICFJ willing to do the initial kind of you know 
prototype testing and funding that. Yeah, but uh, would you agree that we are currently watching what works, what doesn't for all news organizations as, 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 as these stories become available, like these experiences and trying to figure out once we have replicable models, a lot might change. Uh, towards like, uh, this is a question to Gregor. Uh, in your, uh, at the New York Times, there are more uh, uh, online subscribers than uh, print subscribers, though there are a sizable, sizable number of print subscribers. Does that change the web to print, web first uh, equation a bit? Are you producing for web first, or how do you manage the balance between print and online? I mean, um, our graphics department is uh, definitely one of the uh, departments in the New York Times that. Uh, did the transition to web first um, or digital first uh, pretty well. Um, so pretty much all of our graphics are now produced for uh, for online, with, like with, with the web in mind. And um, a, f a part of those graphics are going in print um, because obviously we have more space in uh, online than we have in print and we have faster uh, news cycles. And um, yeah, so we, we do everything web first and then go from, go to print from there. Okay. How is that for, 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 for a news corp? Web, web versus print? Yeah, I mean, the content creation engine is the same now, so it's um, just out of necessity. You, couldn't, you can't no longer afford to have a team that produces only for the web and a team that only produces for, the, uh, for print. Obviously, the priorities and which takes priority tends to be um, different. A simple example uh, from my days at the Washington Post was that for a while the web team had to ask, can I get this story please, right? The default was you will hold it for print. Now I think there's hardly any newsroom where it's the other way around. The print team has to say, can we please hold this story and then have to explain why for a print deadline. So I think that's generally now fairly consistent across most newsrooms because nobody can afford to have two large content creating engines anymore. Okay. How is that for the newspapers you work with? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still a struggle. I mean, it's still a lot of places we work, it's still print first. It's slap, slap up version on, of the, uh, on the website is basically just taking the print paper and putting it online. Okay. Um, but we're trying to get, get folks to, and, and there's a lot of interest in doing that. We work a lot of times in markets with the number two, number three news organization. They're a little hungrier for the change, more willing to sort of shake things up. But, you know, getting newsrooms to change is hard. I remember the Knight Foundation did a uh, study a few years ago that showed that news organizations were the industry that is single most resistant to change. If you moved a desk in a newsroom like that, that was, it, life was over. And I think that, that's, that, that, that is universal, I think, among <laughs> news organizations, wherever they are. Should we open it up for questions? See if anybody has. Yes, yes, before we, yeah. Yes. Any questions from the audience? Um, I think the question is what is the role of editing writers? Khadija, you might want to wait for the mic so that they can translate your question. Um, what is the role of ethics in guiding replicability? Because in South Africa, for example, you have data initiatives that are tracking consumption of low-income consumers, and for example, your pick-and-pay smart card that helps facilitate price, uh, price fixing. So wh what is the role of that? Also, um, due diligence was mentioned. You have private intelligence firms that use these same data systems to help support people that investigative journalists actually want to expose. So should there be ethics guiding replicability? Um, the second question is, outside of tangible revenue, uh, what is the, the value of intangible revenue? In the United States, comedians like Jimmy Fallon are selected and kept on air because of the second viewership that's online. It doesn't generate very much funding, but they do develop uh, brand value based on those people. And that also seems to be another reason why comedians, South African comedian Trevor Noah might be selected now for The Daily Show. He's got a young audience, a global audience, and an African audience. So those two questions, uh, ethics and replicability, and also intangible revenue. Thank you. I'll, I'll take the eth ethics question. Um, um, I, yeah, obviously, ethics are a huge part of anything. Uh, I mean, journal that, if, you know, if there are no journalistic ethics, we have nothing. I think with, if you're talking about data, you know, generating revenue about data products, yeah, if you are selling things to people that you're also investigating, you're, you're creating slippery slopes, there's no doubt. 
I mean, I think to some extent maybe that's why, you know, when I think of just theoretically what are the better, pr better products to sell, I feel sort of ethically more comfortable with the news you can use stuff. Where's your doctor? What's the best school? You know, the kind of stuff you need. Uh, the projects I mentioned in Latin America, these are three, you know, accountability-focused projects. One's tracking crime networks, one's tracking other stuff. And, and, I, and I start thinking about the data potential, and I'm thinking to myself, whoa, okay, so let's say we start selling data about, you know, contracting, you know, who's, who's getting what contract to what in Mexico. Gee, I could see a lot of illicit uses for that. So maybe that is not, a, that is not data you want to create a revenue model around. So I do think there need to be careful careful thinking. Um, and it's a bit of experimenting too. I mean, there's lots of unintended consequences to lots of things. And I think we can try our best and sometimes we're gonna go the wrong way, but I think it's key. Again, if you're experimenting, you can push back. If, you, if you've sort of committed a ton, of, to ton to something and you realize, whoa, I've just you know, let the bad guys have all this information, you're gonna be a little less willing to pull back if you've invested a, a ton in it. There's also a flip side to it, right? That argument is often used, especially by governments, in denying your data. Um, a good example, when I was at the Washington Post, we, was, we did this fairly big project called Top Secret America, which kind of really identified all of the top secret locations and how government was increasingly doing a lot of things. Um, the first, and we were going to put the database and we were going to allow people to put in their zip code and find out if there's a facility near their place and all of that. The first response from the government in the initial, there was a lot of back and forth, was to say, you can't do that because the Chinese will get it. The, you know, and we were like, if you think the Chinese are going to get it from the Washington Post, you are clearly have a problem <laughs> anyway, right? <laughs> but so you have to be careful about how this argument is used to make sure that you don't do something, right? But that is the danger of like, if you start to think of it as a product that has commercial value of its own, it is very hard to say that I will restrict the sale or I will restrict the use case, right? So you have to put in enough protections. The example that um, uh, Merco gave, and this is a very commercial example of the wire cutter, right? Wire cutter reviews a bunch of products and basically tells you upfront that this is the best TV, period. We're not going to say five TVs, pick one, we use, this is the best. Unless wire cutter has very, very strong internal rules, you can imagine that your first suspicion is, is Samsung paying you to say this is the best TV, right? So they have to have the A rules, they have to have transparency around that, they have to communicate to me that this is how we do it, and then I have to have the trust in them to think, okay, these guys are not, even though if you buy and click, you actually make money off that. So that's the tricky part in a lot of newsrooms where there's a lot of debates about, we review a product and we say this is great, should we give the Amazon buy button, even though Amazon is gonna, because it's, it's less about making money and it's more about the perception that people might have, and in thinking, maybe there is a linkage, will they then kind of not trust us? And that's a longer term problem if they don't trust us. So lots of issues, uh, lots of debate, and that's why it's a lot harder than if you're a pure data company, then you just sell data, you don't worry about how it's used. We just found that uh, specifically the section where the wire cutter argues how their model is working, um, I read the text uh, quite a few times because it's quite short, which is surprising, like if I, stumble into this website, how quickly can they build trust with just a few sentences? And I think to some extent they, they, they do that by then pointing back at the quality of the text. They say, just read the whole text. Yes, it says that's the best TV, but it's a three page, four page article, and it shows that we really tested these things. Like, it's not just off the shelf and we looked at 50 televisions before we made a decision to say this is the best. Uh, and that is interesting. I think that is, uh, these short bursts of text need to be watched. How a brand that <laughs> says I'm ju a journalistic brand, so I'm different from the others, um, argues for, for trust. Um, when will there be a market for putting a sticker on these pages saying we are not selling your data, like in a, in a stronger sense? Do you see a market for that coming, like uh, solving that uh, ethic questions by being fiercely on the user side? Yeah, I, like I said, I think there is a privacy economy that uh, hopefully will emerge where a publisher will say, dear reader, this is what we collect from you, this is how we protect it, and by the way, this is the advantage of giving us this data because we serve you better, because we serve you better stories or whatever. I think that conversation is starting to happen um, in a big way, but for that to happen, a couple of things need to, are precursors, right? One, 
you've got to be able to collect and protect data. If you have a bunch of third parties like the outbrains and all these guys on your site that who are siphoning off data and reusing that, then you don't have a claim to kind of make that argument, one. Two, you have to have a ability to really understand what this data means. A lot of newsrooms haven't really invested in that yet. Okay. Right? So there, is, there are those challenges, I think. And then there is a communication issue of like being able to communicate effectively as to why. Look, people pay the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times come to us because there is already a trust factor. So I think we've got to be able to kind of take advantage of that and say, here is how we are protecting your data, but here is how we are using it. Here is how we don't sell it. For example, News Corp uh, basically came out with a policy that said we don't sell any data to any third parties, right, period, which most sites actually do right now. So I think you've got to have that before you get to your point about we, you know, a good housekeeping stamp of approval of this site or every page. Yeah. I don't know about you though, I never trust any site that tells me as I'm clicking something, I, we don't sell your data, I never believe it, okay. I, I, ne never. So the communication part is going to be become critical yeah. and you have to prove it, right? I mean, I can't just tell Sharon that I'm not using it because I am using it in some ways, yeah. but I have to say here's how I'm using it and by the way, Sharon, here's the value you get out of it. Unless she makes that calculation, she will not want to give anything. So you had a second question about the intangible effects of uh, this branding. And th I think there's a point. What we see right now is the way, I, I, I looking at the last four or five years, The Guardian made a big rise in being an international newspaper, which it wasn't 10 years ago, not to that extent. Um, so these brands and how they develop and how they position themselves at journalistic offerings, um, that's an important issue. How does that play out? What do you think about the intangible assets of, of doing these great stuff, like what the New York Times newsroom graphics team is doing? How does that play out building, uh, strengthening the brand? You, you have an opinion on that? What do you think you, you're working like that or you don't care? You just do the next back, uh, best story and then I mean, I, th I think it, the, the, the work we do definitely um, helps to, um, to build this, this, this trust in, uh, in, in the New York Times brand, of course, but um, it's not really a thing that we that, that or I would think about every day. I'm just trying to do the, um, um, the graphics that I, uh, I want to do and that I think uh, will help people. Um, there's uh, there's definitely uh, we're trying to do uh, stuff that that is in that's helping the public. Um, to um, you were talking about this like uh, personal decision making, and we we already built a tool that's called Rent or Buy that is kind of a, a, a web interactive that uh, like you can enter like a lot of information about. Um, where you want to move, or what what kind of house you might want to buy, and then uh, in the end you you you, you get a decision of if it's better for you to rent it or to buy it. Um, but this is not a product; this is just part of the service you get as a subscriber of the New York Times. So, so um, this is one of the examples that I find marvelous and interesting uh, how they break it down that the newspaper is able to give this decision by breaking down the data model behind it, uh, rent or buy calculator from the New York Times. Um, your opinion on the intangible effect? I, I have a, the opposite opinion, which is that I think most newsrooms have hidden behind the intangibles for a long time. Oh. Because they, that's why they don't think about revenue, that's why they don't kind of pay attention to cost. They just say, this is the New York Times, this is what people expect of us, let's spend a lot of money and do this. Wall Street Journal, <laughs> sorry, I mean to pick, pick on New York Times. So everything has been intangible, right? You can measure us because we are this, you know, we are mm -hmm. producing this amazing journalism and there's, you know, there's fundamental value in that and so don't measure anything, right? That's been, up until very recently, that's been the argument most editors have made every year when the budget time comes, right? But I think the issue here is thanks in print that held because it was very hard to connect actual behavior, get the data and six months later you will get readership surveys that were not very useful. In digital, there's no place to hide anymore so you can't say that I produced this amazing thing and nobody read it, by the way, because you saw the clicks, and, but it's still worth doing it. Right? It is still worth doing it, but if, you, if nobody clicked on something you thought it was worth doing, the problem is not the reader, the problem is you. Right? You haven't made it engaging enough for them to kind of click with, on it. So I think it's good that we are measuring a lot. I would argue that no television decision is intangible at all, actually. Well before newspapers, they've been measuring 
ratings, and they measure every day. So whatever they might say about intangibles are always connected back to some very, very tangible stuff, right? Because if you get 100,000 people more in the 19 to 22 age group by picking a particular comedian, that is completely monetizable. And they do it. They may not articulate it that way. I would argue that I would love to be in the position of television where I measure it across time, age, space. Right? We are still, thanks to digital, we are able to. Uh, we are far from um, worrying about kind of it being measured too much in our business. We're not measuring enough. I, I still think, I think you, you've had that change at, at, at the higher levels in these organizations. I think many reporters still are extremely resistant to it. And they and there's still a feeling that yes, you can measure it, but are is that really measuring the value of what we do? So while yes, the metrics exist, um, I don't think everybody necessarily subscribes to their value. Um, and you know, then there and then there's the exponential thing. Maybe ten only ten people on, clicked on my store. Maybe it was the right ten people. Uh, maybe know? being the problem. <laughs> yeah, may, you're right. Maybe we need to know better. So I think I mean, you know, we're you know, trust me, we are very metrics driven as well. And um, and I agree, getting journalists to, 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 to recognize that something they've seen as intangible is actually tangible and measurable. There's a lot of resistance to it. It needs to be done, but I think there's also a sense that we've gone, you know, we're, we're, we're cowing too much to the, to the metrics as well and bowing down to the, you know, the god of measurement. Um, mm -hmm. And again, going to who those 10 people might be, I think there's still people who believe those could be the right 10 people. Maybe we just need to get better at measuring it so we know who those 10 people are. Okay, any other questions? We should ask Justin to talk a little bit about his, sorry, there was a question. <laughs> you escaped, Justin. What is progress currently in the market? I'm Dennis Redman, I teach at the journalism school here at Perugia. <coughs> and I'm asking, what is the progress uh, in your markets of the, um, evaluating performance of a journalist and linking it to his salary and the number of clicks that he receives, has that model progressed uh, or evolved in any way in regard to monetization of what he produces? I know that Bloomberg, for example, does this for a portion of the salary of some of their staff. So has this spread at all? And what is the connection to then the end result of the pot of gold after that? So uh, I think because of the skew of the panel towards big brands, Sharon <laughs> being an exception in the sense that she deals with mostly non-US or non-Western brands. So the answer will be very different if some, there were people here from like purely digital enterprises, I think. Um, newspapers have always measured um, Editors have always kept lists of scoops, page one stories, enterprise stories. They may have never particularly articulated that, but I've been, you know, I, this is my 25th year or something in this business. At the Wall Street Journal, every editor knew whether they shared it or not, how many page one stories I wrote, right? And that did factor into my raises, not overtly at all. So it isn't like the measuring aspect of it is new to our business. Obviously with digital, the ability to measure much more faster and more granular has come about. My experience is that in most major newsrooms, while the data is available and maybe some editors actually see it, very few have made the formal linkage between raises, bonuses, and salaries to that issue. But there's a higher level of awareness. So if somebody is performing in their break, writing a lot of stories and producing a lot of, they, the people who decide your salaries know that for sure. Um, I don't think it's particularly uh, directly linked. There are some efforts um, in the. Yeah, un unlikely. Unlikely in most uh, major newsrooms because typically the way it works is that an editor will get. They'll say this year, based on everything, you're getting three percent for the entire newsroom. How you allocate it to individuals is up to you. That's your total. So that's where the variance has come. But you're starting to see some experiments, even in big newsrooms. For example, the social media teams in some places um, are, are being told that, look, 
it's great that you are measuring likes and measuring sharing and all that, but it is possible to also measure conversion, meaning that how many people linking or clicking on Facebook links or Twitter links have actually then become subscribers because you can now measure that. And I think there is starting to be kind of a little bit of a correlation saying how many subscribers has your effort generated because getting subscribers is much better long term for your journalism also. Very nascent efforts, nobody wants to talk about it precisely because you get beaten up saying how, how dare you link journalism to, out, to kind of end results. Um, as the pressure on our industry gets uh, more um, tighter and more sophisticated, you start seeing a bit more of it. Those of us who don't have big mainstream legacy, Wall Street Journal has done a, things a particular way for 126 years, right? So it's very hard to kind of switch that and change that. But if you're Vox who has come around in the last five years, maybe they have different models. Um, and I personally sitting here think that it's not a bad thing, provided you know what you're, what you're measuring and the relevance of that. Uh, one uh, which is connecting to your question, I think uh, it, the, this kind of measurement becomes toxic if it's just for quantity and has maybe some relevance to some extent when it's about quality. But the quality is harder to measure. You were saying that conversion is more like a quality, like an outcome of something. Yeah? It can be a proxy. And I think end of the day, as with all editors, I think that there is a fair element of subjectiveness to this, which I think should be there. But the subjectiveness ought to be informed by objective data. It can be now because of digital. Oh. Okay. At one point, we're not, I mean, in the markets we're seeing either legacy newsrooms that are still, you know, trying to catch up or a lot of digital startups that are not there yet in terms of they just need to get going. They're not going to start, you know, cutting people because they're not getting enough clicks yet. Um, one thing we saw, that kind of uh, an aside, but interesting, at the Star in Kenya, the newspaper, um, where we did these data journalism projects with an embedded developer, really trying to build teams around that. The, and this is, a, I think, the sec second largest news organization in Kenya. They instituted into their performance reviews that every uh, journalist had to acquire data journalism skills. They saw the value to it. I mean, they had different, different ways of measuring it. Not everyone was going to have the exact same skills, but they saw the need for that, and they built that into their performance reviews, which in turn is going to affect your, your salary. So that's another way that is a little less just how many clicks did you get, but that ensures that you're getting your, your journalists to sort of be on the same, the same page and the page you need, you know, the direction you need to go. That's been an interesting thing to see. I think the principle, sorry, did you want to add something? No, I think the principle that in 2015, the definition of journalism ought to be expanded to say that it is my job as a journalist to get more people to read my journalism is not, I don't think anybody can argue against that, right? All I'm saying is if you're creating something, then what is wrong in saying I want more people to consume what I'm creating? And the newsroom will give you the tools to help you get more people to read your journalism. In, in the old print world, there is a department called circulation marketing, which goes out and brings people to become subscribers. In the digital world, there is a department called marketing, but it is nobody's job to bring people to your story but yourself pretty much. So nothing wrong in thinking about journalism as also saying, as part of a journalist, I want more people to read what I produce. And that can be measured, there can be tools to help, and that's a, I think it's a, it doesn't go against any notions of what journalism is or isn't by measuring that. So I guess we will have new sessions starting at uh, the full hour. Thanks very much everyone for attending, thanks for being on the podium. If there are any questions to people on the podium, uh, please come over. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Thank you.